All right, guys. I'm, um, I have one more sheet I want to pass around. We've looked at this a couple times. This is your name, email, phone number, that whole sheet. So the first uh, class I had, you look at this and then make the changes. And so I made the changes, so I want you to verify the changes. And then also the group assignments have been made at the very right. Uh, so make sure that I got you in the right group also. Okay? Capiche? There's any changes to make, make them if there's not. Hey, there's that free work. <laughs> Found it. Yeah, that's our free There we go. Hey, you want to back your way? Okay, so, let's see, was there anything else? So, where we were is we were talking about this new framework the fire regime. Um, is everyone clear on what a fire regime is and what the purpose of a fire regime is for? Yeah. Who is it? Maybe how about a quick refresher? All right, let's have a quick refresher. Uh, does anybody want to try to explain it? I mean, I can explain it, but let's have somebody else explain it. Say that a set of variables that um, can uh, allow a person to discuss a certain type of environment that has in fireplace. Okay, so what does that allow you to do? You said, so you brought up you said variables, so categorize. different factors, right? What's that? Are you able to categorize? Yeah, that was an important part, right? And what were those categorizations that we went through? What were some of those categorizations with the Hardy and the Heinzelman? And what did those look like? Time, intervals. percent burn. Time, the fire return intervals, um, the percent burn. What did you say so? No, I said Okay, all right. Um, what else went into those categories, those fire regime categories? Severity. Severity. And what do they mean by severity? How hot the fire burn and how much they consume. So, Maybe. yeah, right. So when they talk about severity, remember they talk about those thresholds of severity? 75% uh, consumed. What was it that they were talking about was consumed 75% or more or less? Of what was supposed to be there? Uh, what's the name of that? Um, no, yeah. Dominant. Dominant. Overstory. Remember the dominant overstory? Okay, so, so you have um, for the the say the Hardy ones, which are those were the five. There was five fire regimes. Remember how it started off in fire regime one was frequent recurrent fire, but the severity was not very high. That's what happens in general with fires. If you have a, a regime, if you have a fire regime where characteristically there's a lot of fire that goes through there. Well, actually, I'm, I'm wrong with that. Okay. In a timber, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. What I was going to say is that usually when there's a lot of fire, it's not that severe. But why did I correct myself? Because that's not always the case. Because that's not always the case. What, what was the example that I thought of that made me realize that I was wrong? Uh, Frequent recurrent fire. What's a what is an ecosystem or a fire regime that has frequent recurrent fire but it's high severity? Grass. Grass. Remember that? Grass. Yep. Grass is one. So that's why I corrected myself. So, but in like a fire regime one, uh, like a timber stand, like say Mount Laguna, which has a fire return interval of say 12 years, characteristically it has a lot of fire through it every 10, 12 years or so. But the, the overstory just takes it, right? The only thing that burns is like a little bit of brush and grass and the, uh, the litter layer, okay? Versus, say, like a fire regime five. Remember, five was the last one. 200 years, 200 years of very long fire return interval. And what about the severity? High severity. High severity. Um, I'm not sure I can answer why, but does anybody have an answer for why it's that way? Why isn't it 200 years and, and a low severity? Yeah, like so much accumulation. Yeah, yeah. Years. yeah. It's probably it's accumulation. It's like a match. It has to have that accumul high accumulation and high intensity in order for it to actually start. Burning. 200 years of anything, right? Right. It needs yeah. that much time to even uh, propagate and, and take a fire. If it is burning, maybe it's the ideal, ideal conditions for it to burn. So that's why it is burning, which would make it more severe. 
Right, yeah, exactly. And remember how we talked about that? Where right. maybe you need a drought year every 250 years? And you said they could have the same piece of land could have multiple regimes, right? So that was, I, I think that's probably true in some, some places. That was an earlier take. That was the, uh, the I think it was the Heinzelman regimes from the Lake States. Um, but I mean, we've seen different you know, we've seen different regimes where you can get fires come through, and then say like you get some frequent fire, and then you get another one come through. Yeah, so I think that's where like this categorization versus non-categorization comes through. Me personally, and I think a lot of people would agree that there's no nature doesn't work. Nature doesn't really want to be categorized. Do you guys understand what I mean by that? You know, nature is not 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 so. Um, formula. A formula. That's a good way of putting it. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Nature is not a formula. It doesn't work that way. You have to respect that. Um, yeah. So that's the fire regimes, and then our we can use it for different. We can use it in a land management application. So we can say we want our chaparral to exist in a fire regime four, and then we can manage it to, uh, well, I don't know if we could, but we could try to manage it within that. We are managing our chaparral, or we're trying to. So right now what's going on in our chaparral, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, is that we're having too much fire, right? We're having too frequent of fires because there's too many people dragging too many chains randomly, you know, down I-8, I and an area burns, and then it burns again, and it burns again. So characteristically, chaparral needs at least 35-year interval. I've got this map I should bring in sometime, but it shows there's certain areas that have definitely burned more than that, and, and then you start to have effects, and we're going to talk about that, but you, know, you start to have negative effects. Reproduction strategies get affected. For instance, if a tree needs a certain amount of time, or a, a shrub species needs a certain amount of time to, to happen with no fire, and there is a fire, well, then that affects it. Maybe it burns up all the seed crop, and, and so you see some type changes in the vegetation. We'll talk about this. But um, anyway, oh, so what, you know what I always say is that in Southern California, a fire engine is a tool of ecological restoration. You understand why I'm saying that now? Because if we're putting out our fires, we're putting out all these extra fires. We're trying to meet that 35-year floor. Right? We're trying to get chaparral to be older, and that's really the story with chaparral. We need our chaparral to be older so it can get back into the category or the characteristic fire regime that it once held. Now that's, do we really need to do that? I don't know. It doesn't really do anything for our economy or for whatever. Um, maybe watershed stabilization, but it's something that we're making a value as a society that we want our ecosystems to be functioning properly. Is everyone following me? So, yeah, Jose. Yeah, so when you say an ecosystem, you're including everything that's supposed to characteristically be there. Um, yes, that's good, yeah. <clears throat> isn't, so, so we're gonna refer to the Cutca fire. Sure. First time I. So the Cutca fire, to refresh everybody, so that It was know. on the north slope of the Palomar district. It burned in the biggest brush that I've seen on the cleaning. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So we were we went back and looked for records of any possible fire back there because there is signs of fire in some of the stumps back there, and the closest we got was 1960, the Palomar fire or something like that. Anyway, um, what was interesting about being walking around in, in there was that there's no animal track, there, there's no there's no deer beds, there's nothing like that. There's no wild, there's no habit, there's no usage <clears throat> from wildlife is what you're saying? Yeah, so the ecosystem is composed of just the, the chaparral. And the birds maybe they can access and Correct. rodents, uh, that sort of thing, yeah. What it is, isn't maybe 35, 40, 50 years, isn't that too long? I mean... <laughs> you know I can't answer that question. <laughs> I, yeah, but you you said something very interesting, you said that... Uh, that we need to get it back to that 35 year because we're burning it too often. Because it's accidental fire ignitions. Okay. Or accidental ignitions. Okay. Sure. Anthropomorphic is the term, but that just means people cause ignitions. People okay. dragging the chain down Highway 79 causing the fire. What we like to manage for is natural ignitions only. So lightning fires or volcanoes or 
Yeah. Is there any others? Yeah. Anything else is potentially viewed as a human input, and that is invariably a human input to a fire. Uh, let me say this again. If a human starts a fire, as a society and as a land manager, we view that as bad. Not natural. Not natural. Not characteristic. Sorry. More specifically. <laughs> Hold on, let me finish my point with uh, Jose. Um, if I, if, I don't know if I did finish my point or not. Yeah, I missed that very little. I missed that. I, I, all I heard was burning too often. Oh, getting to the 35 years. Right. Yeah. So um, we, ha we have chosen as land managers to try. We want the, the vegetation. What we value is that we want the vegetation that is there. The vegetation is really sort of like the lowest common denominator with the ecosystem. And most of the time, you can't have an ecosystem functioning properly if you don't have the vegetation in a, in a characteristic fashion. In other words, the way it had been for millennia, the vegetation existing within the natural range of variability for, uh, for fires and all that sort of thing is what we want to get at. But right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing impacted ecosystems. Does that make, make sense? Yeah, and then so. Okay. So, at what point do we take into consideration Native American communities that are in all the valleys? Yeah. Quite, uh, quite yeah. possibly putting fire on the ground every year. So that's the big question mark. <laughs> that and that's that's such an excellent point. And CJ, I, I haven't forgotten. And tie in if this ties into what you're saying, but um, we I don't know. To be honest with you, I mean, there's different ways of looking at this, and everyone else can um, can jump in here, right? But my view is that we kind of ignore that, but we also look at it at the same time. Because the fact is, a lot of what we want to manage for has been affected for so long by the indigenous burning practices that it's almost like we can't tell the difference. So like we almost can't, couldn't discern the difference between what existed without Native American input and, and what would just exist naturally. And so personally, I think most people have come to the conclusion that what existed with the Native American inputs has been around for so long. Remember how I, I gave you that example that as soon as they crossed the Bering Strait, they lit a campfire and it, and it escaped? Like, that's my take on it anyway. There might be other people. And, you know, there's certainly very well there, variability there because there's a lot of places where Native Americans didn't go and thus didn't affect the fuel strata. You know, like super high elevation places. If there's no reason, there's no water and there's no food, there's no game, there's no place. I mean, there's no reason to go. There's no reason for them to go there. Um, you know, they weren't going to like Disneyland or whatever. You know, they were going to find places to drink, places to eat, places that were warm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was a much more practical society. So when you get it really more, like you really look at it in a, in, for what it really is, the areas, you know, habitation, streams and valleys, and those places are very impacted by Native American usage, but other places aren't. So, but then you have the whole landscape, which includes all of that. So what do you manage for? Does that make sense? It's very complicated. All right, did I explain that adequately? You guys understand that? Anybody else have anything to add to that? Don't we have, and I'm, I'm really new and still trying to learn everything, but isn't there a meadow up on Tribuco that is being managed? Junko Meadow. Yeah. Junko Meadow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a basket weaver? Yeah, that yeah, is being true. managed for <coughs> indigenous people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a perfect example. So we have Junko Meadow. I think it's called Junko Meadow. Junko Meadow. Junko is the plant, is it not? Uh, yeah, it's the junkies in there that likes the bird. Right. For the basket. But I thought there was something else that was being managed. Um, I think it was deer grass. It's a real funky. I, I know that meadow we have to burn. We have, they want us to burn, but not the whole thing, just like a small portion. Yeah, yeah, it's a quarter. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a perfect example that Lisa's brought up, which is that there's a Junko Meadow up on Tribuco. It's like, 10 acres maybe or something like that. I don't know, right? Five acres maybe? And the Native American Basket Weavers Association has come to us. It's a real thing, all that. It's not like you're on the water basket weaving. They've come to us and asked us to burn it because it favors a certain species. They did that. That's a, a classic Native American use of fire, is that they had certain species that they used uh, to make baskets out of them and various things. And so they managed for it, just like we managed for it. So, you know, that's, I think that's something that, you know, we do willingly and it went through the NEPA process and everything we're cool with, but 
Is that a restoration objective or is that a feel good objective? I, you know, it's hard to answer those sort of questions. It's a cultural objective. There you go, cultural objective. Yeah. I can tell you, Stephen, that we haven't burned the whole thing to the best of my knowledge, and we used to have to go in there on our hands and knees and yeah. pick a lot these. Of Pick all the invasive species once a year, so yeah. I'm really looking forward to picking the long beads. Yeah, we have several different places, several different projects that we've started working with our archaeologists to work with the tribes to manage adjacent lands to their land to help with cultural influences like that. Yeah. So burning willows, burning bear grass, uh, and we, we involve them, we bring them out to the burns and they participate. Yeah, no, it's a cool thing. It's a very cool thing. Um, but again, you're managing for, a, in lack of a term, another term, you're managing for a human use of that. Is that the highest, is that the highest use of the land? Or, you know, because we always talk about we want it to be the, the characteristic or the natural state. But at the same point, like, that's part of our agency objective. Yeah, that's multiple true. Use. Multiple use. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. This is what makes it so interesting all the time. Okay, so Keep bringing these questions up. This is just such a great topic, but this is where we're at, right? Susie, go ahead. We had a, um, I mean, I, I, the video that was sent out by, um, I think it's just a blip from Randy Moore. Mm -hmm. um, seen it. But he goes into, you know, uh, managing our force, kind of what we do as a whole, as a vision through force service, but not blah, 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 just the part where it's talking about we put out fires, and or they become so small, they don't um, burn the small um, trees that end up growing and kind of like sucking all the water out from watershed areas yeah. and stuff. And he's talking about how that needs to be managed but not. So I, I just thought it was interesting since we're in this topic that he kind of brings that topic out. And I don't know if that's like the overall um, what we do or if that's exclusive to a certain area he's talking about. He mostly talks about Northern California and managing Hmm. our wildfires and other stuff, but it went into a big scenario stuff, but he didn't mention that specifically, and I thought it was interesting that he used that analogy, because it's so complex, like you're talking, mm -hmm. as far as chaparral, and so my question with that was, chaparral, is that not something then that we're looking at them overgrowing and affecting the watershed areas, or is that kind of dependent on who's going to do that study next to any water area that's depleted or whatever? I would argue humans have a stronger influence on water depletion in the area as opposed to the native drought adapted plants. <laughs> yeah, like so like our area in particular is a very high zone for watershed. We we support Kemet mm -hmm. and all the areas and that was always what was fought because of water and the lack of it. But we have like Lake Hemet that was man made created for that. And we also have the Diamond Valley Lake, which was recently created and is a huge watershed, but doesn't come to us. It goes like to LA and other places, which yeah. is political in itself. But I, I'm just, I know that historically our area is a watershed area that we used to manage for, but it, it kind of merged into um, doing prescribed burns for vegetation. So if I, if I understand your question correctly, are you asking if we manage chaparral for, like, say, water yield for watershed use. Yeah. Because most of the time, people are interested in water yield. Um, well, yield. I mean, in th that particular case that he was talking about was that it sucked the water from watershed areas where fires should burn out, like natural thinning is kind of what he's talking about, where they're mm -hmm. not, you know, um, yeah. competing with each other. So that'll be a great question to ask a hydrologist, but I'll take a stab at that and anybody wants to. My understanding of this is, you know, so watershed and water yield management is always sort of a, a two-edged sword. You, ha you have to have plants to stabilize the slopes, right? And those plants obviously use water. Uh, but some people will also look at it as, well, if you cut those plants and you don't have the water usage, thus you'll get more water yield. But then you have that... Again, going back to that, we have the potential for siltation, and actually the worst thing for our watershed is the siltation, which is the erosion off the, off the slopes to go down, because what that does is that creates a real economic impact because you get that silt into the reservoir, and that lowers the amount it can hold to begin with, um, and then it costs a lot of money to pull that out, and so that's always sort of a balance. 
But I have I personally have never come across vegetation management for water to yield in Southern California. In other words, I've never seen us have an objective, or even in the past, have an objective to get rid of chaparral vegetation in order to increase the amount of water that's coming off of it. I have, however, seen that in the Great Basin and other places where juniper encroachment is coming in, and I actually have a case study that I'm going to share. Well, that it actually depends on if the end presents it or not. But of that saying, where we did a uh, where we did a project where we were cutting all the juniper, and I think I might have mentioned in the past we saw a watershed effect to it. So. For what it's worth in the chaparral, I've never seen. Most of the time, watershed protection in the chaparral means preventing fires so you're not slicking off the slopes so that erosion isn't going down into the watershed. So, so the value of having vegetative landscapes in your watershed is the slow release of water. Mm. When you have these big dammed up areas, and let's say your slopes had nothing on it, and that water rushes in there, initially, yeah, you are going to have uh, a high level of water, but we're in a rather arid environment. So as that water sits unprotected behind a dam, the rate of evapotranspiration is disgustingly high in areas like this. And the water that's being evaporated off the yeah, reservoir. Yeah, I won't even get into that right there. But when you can have vegetation on the slopes, what it does is it slows that precipitation rate and has a chance to seep into the soil then and as it finds its way through the soil, it makes its way underground to those water sources. So there are limited cases though, and it's usually non-natives, um, where you want to do removal to improve the watershed. So things like tamarisk, really, really invasive woody species that can suck a lot of water out of riparian areas yeah. and actually change hydrologic flows. But as far as the native vegetation doing it, unless you have, we'd see this a little bit in our, our lodgepole stands in Colorado, um, if it's like severely overstocked with just dog hair lodgepole. So way too many trees burning. Yeah, 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 way too much. I mean, because fire had been off the landscape for so long. Um, in those cases, it can be bad, but it's not nearly as detrimental as the non-native stealing of the water. I don't know if that helps. It does. Now, is that because the root systems are, are farther down and they suck more? Because they're drought adapted, there's a lot of different ways that um, not only how they take up water, but how they hold water. So something that's drought adapted, um, they can actually survive off of really, really low amounts of water. And I mean, some species will senesce, so they'll drop all of their leaves and they'll be in like a dormant state, and so they won't be taking anything up. You've got some that will have really fine hairs all throughout, and what that does is it slows the plant's rate of evaporation, so the water within the plant can't go out into the environment as quickly. Um, coloration is another one. The, the more in the bluish range that the plants are, the less that they will also evaporate. So the ability for the plants on the landscape to draw the water down into the soils where it now has the chance to make its way through the underground watershed, awesome. Awesome when, when you talk about water yield. Good, thank you. Cool. Quick. Hey, uh, I have a question. You said that the shop bell burns too frequently. Uh, is that as a whole, you think, or I guess it's a question for you, or just in those population dense areas? So there, the, if you look at the mapping of that, and like I said, I've got this awesome map i got to show you guys. Uh, it's the favorite map I've ever seen. Fire history? It's not a fire history map. It's actually uh, a map that shows, it's, um, it's, so it's ignition frequency. So okay. it shows all the places where fire is started, and I have it for the Descanso District. I actually got it for all, but the one I'm thinking of is the Descanso District. Shows all of the places where fire started in the last, I think, 20 years. Okay. And then what it does is it models a fire, like using a modeling program, where it models the potential for that. So if we didn't take suppression action on that. And what it does is it uses a red to blue spectrum, and so the red areas are the places where 
there's a lot of fires where the frequent, uh, ignition frequency is pretty high, and then the blue areas is where the ignition frequency, that is, the amount of the places where there hasn't been a lot of fires, or has not been a lot of fires. Um, yeah, I lost my train. It's blue. Anyway, it's really cool. Where would you expect to see a lot of fires? The population dense areas, the but, railways. What was that? I8. I8 is the biggest one in the scans of the population. It's where the people are. Okay, fi fire follows people. So on the Descanso district, you have Interstate 8, and it's a giant red streak through it. And you have a, a little less of a red streak down Hapitol Valley Road, and Sunrise Highway to a lesser degree. Oh, I've, seen, I've seen those maps. Yeah. Yeah, Metzger, uh, Tim Metzger is going to be coming in later. Created it. It's a brand new product that he created. Now I should show that. Uh, Diane Travis had one with It's because he used that process okay. on, on yeah, the that. Master Cool Break Strategy. So, what was the question though? Well, you said that we. we oh, where the changes were. Yeah. We haven't done it, but I would imagine that you could take that same map where you have all the, the frequency, the ignition frequency, and overlay the vegetation on it, and I would guess that the, there's a difference in the vegetation in those places than the places that are like blue where there isn't the ignition frequency, which tends to be away from the people out in the back no, 40. No, I understand. I guess my question though is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, those areas are going to have, definitely have more fire history, more fire scars. But what about those places farther in? You know, I mean, are we, is there enough fire in those, or like uh, you were saying, Jose was saying, you know, where that brush is so thick, it, it may have been 50 to 100 years. Is there right. any fire history in there? Right. So I know there's places on these forests that there's not a lot of recorded fire history. Maybe, I don't know what the Cleveland, but I know where I came from, there's areas where they don't have any recorded fire history. Yeah. Well, I would say those areas are operating within their fire regime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the most part. And they tend to be pretty intact ecosystems. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a very wide, widely diverse. The chaparral is very diverse. You have a lot of places near communities, houses, roads where the chaparral is not intact and there's a lot of places in the back 40. And even some places that aren't even so much in the back 40, like Palomar Mountain, the whole north slope of Palomar Mountain is pretty intact actually. A lot of it is. Um, so kind of depends. But it's definitely correlated, to use the correlation, to uh, people and usage. Yeah. So, okay. Cool. We good? All right, so let's talk a little bit about this new framework, fire regime stuff. A lot of this is definitions. We just have a couple concepts to get through. Um, we talked already about these three major categories, temporal, which is time, spatial, area, and magnitude, which is just a hard time defining that, the extent of the effect. So we're just going to basically, all we're going to do now for a little while is go through we're just going to go through these in order, and but there's a little more definition. So this is the outline. So uh, temporal seasonality. So with seasonality, seasonality is, is one of the things that are, is really important to look at. Seasonality, that is, when, at, or rather, at what time of the year the fire is burning, is really important because things are way different in summer than they are in the middle of December in terms of air temperature. Uh, solar radiation, sun angle, soil moisture is one thing that gets overlooked a lot, but really soil moisture affects a lot of things, like we talked about with that burning the mastication. In fact, in our NEPA documents, we have to, uh, we actually have a mitigation in our mastication um, that when we burn mastication, it must be done when the soil is wet. Why and why do we do that, do you know? It's it's a water water. Water. <coughs> it's a, it is, it is. So scorch the soil and all that heat going right on because yeah. it's already on the ground there. But what happens, so that's why we have it in there, but why, what happens in the summer to that soil? It's shaded by all that mastication. Or I should say, what happens to that soil in the summer when a fire goes through? Let me clarify that, sorry. Are you talking about residency time? I'm just talking about what happens to that soil in the summer when a fire burns through. Say it's a standard chaparral. The nutrients gets cooked out of it? Well, that probably does happen, yeah. Is that soil taking heat? Yeah. yeah it's taking a lot of heat. Yeah. Is it okay afterwards? Yeah. Probably not for as long as the duration, wear, yeah. I don't know. Our soil, like we talked about, you need that, that enough heat for some of that seeds to germinate. Okay. I'm actually saying, I don't know why we have that mitigation in our NEPA. Because I know why, but like, but, that, but why though? Because the it, part of it's a safety, it's so-called safety reason. Yeah. Like 
reason why it's done. Because if, if, if it's moist, it has less of an opportunity to get outside of its prescribed area. Oh, you're talking about prescribed fire mitigation? No. Oh. Just that the whole concept of the moist soil. Okay. Well, the fact of the matter is that when we burn a prescribed fire, or when we do our prescribed fire in the winter, is most of the time the worst thing you can do for the environment. It's very bad for the environment, especially chaparral. Because chaparral soils, the seed banks, and those sort of things are built upon burning in freaking July and August. Um, really hot fires. And a lot of our seeds need it. To the point where, actually, in the old papers in the 50s and the 60s, when they talked about how to type convert chaparral, they say to do it when the soils are moist, when the temperatures are low, because that actually is the complete opposite of the reproduction strategy of these plants. You follow? A plant wants to be happy. It wants to burn in the summer. Chaparral, remember this, chaparral wants to burn in the summer. The seeds want to be burned really hotly in the summer. It's the way the thing was designed for as long as there's been fire in the chaparral. When we do it, which is a seasonality based thing, is, is not when things are supposed to be done. So we actually do get more invasive of exotic species and this sort of thing. Uh, we don't get the germination that should be coming up. So I just throw that out there, but it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, it is easier to burn and control a prescribed fire, obviously, during that time period. Um, but it, the point I'm trying to make is that seasonality has an effect on the landscape. When you burn uh, matters, is what I'm trying to say. When you burn matters. And you have to relate that to the characteristic fire regime. So under a characteristic fire regime, when it burns, has effects. Make sense? Anybody follow that? Mm -hmm. This is one of the more important part, uh, things I want you to remember. So different parts of the country have different fire seasons. Um, where I started in fire, back east, the one in the more Midwest specifically, there's two fire seasons. There's a spring season and there's a fall fire season. Um, the spring season happens after it gets warm enough, but before the grasses start um, greening up. And then the fall season happens after the leaves fall off the oak trees. Um, they're completely different seasons, but uh, there's two fire seasons. And nothing burns in the summer in Illinois because it's raining and it's green in the whole Midwest. Uh, you know, in the southwest, it's early spring to summer, before the monsoons, late um, If you're in high elevation montane, which means high elevation, uh, uh, montane just means, uh, you know, mountainous, like the 200 year fire return intervals, right? So you have to do late summer. You only get that, uh, you're only going to get that fire regime five fire late in the summer. And not only is it just, you know, you have that five week growing season, uh, it's going to be, I guarantee you those fires in a fire regime 5, where the 200 year plus, it's going to be in like the last two weeks of it. So, anyway, so chaparral, or SoCal chaparral is late summer and early fall. Um, why is it late summer and early fall? Drying time. So when it's hotter, it's drier, what's that? Drying time. Yeah, the drying time, you have to, that pulse of moisture that we get typically in December and January, you get the live fuel moistures and it takes a while for it to come down to a point where it can. Um, so our characteristic fire return interval, or uh, fire regime is lit. So what's it? Plus, I think my, my true feeling with Southern California chaparral is if you light it at any other time of the year, you take that torch away and it goes out. Right. You need that drying time. You need the winds that are created in that time, that, that, that year. I'm drawing blank. For it to uh, become a fuel-driven fire. Yeah. It's a fuel-driven yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. No, that's a good point. Uh, and you don't see that until later. All right, perfect. So that's seasonality. That just refers to when it happens. So fire return interval, we already talked about this. So this is kind of uh, going over. It's just the length of time between fires on a specific area of land. So you have this particular area of ground. It is when this particular area of ground has seen a fire again, and then the length of time until it sees another piece of ground. Uh, the length of time until it sees another fire, OK? Um, so you have to pick the location. So that's why, I mean, and that's important to look at too, is because, um, you know, a fire return interval is very specific to a location. The Cleveland National Forest, you can't just say, what is the fire return interval of the Cleveland National Forest? What do you think is more appropriate to tie a fire return interval to instead of something like, say, the Cleveland National Forest? So what district or smaller? The district or smaller, and then what are... What, yeah, what did I hear earlier? Fuel type. Yeah, I think it's really related to a fuel type, uh, more than anything. I mean, what it, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so it needs to be uh, something that 
is the same. Okay, and then so there's this concept. So we know what fire return interval. We'll talk about this. And the fire return interval is really, really important for what we're interested in managing because again, uh, when a fire comes through and the amount of time that it takes to get another fire through affects so much. It affects how long the, the vegetation has to recover, um, you know, fuel accumulation again, uh, reproduction strategy. Uh, we'll talk about that some more. So anyway, fire rotation is just how long it takes for an entire area of land to witness a fire. This is a term that doesn't get a lot of usage. You could more appropriately look at fire rotation, like say a, a, a forest in the southeast. Are you guys familiar with the forests in the southeast that have a lot of fire, like Will was talking about in Florida, where they burn 25,000 acres? When I went to Florida, and we went to the Ocala National Forest, I believe, it's like 100,000 acres or something like that, and you look at the burn plants in there, so it's this longleaf pine ecosystem. Longleaf pine is one of those species that, first of all, needs fire to get it out of this initial seedling stage. So it exists for three years, fire comes through, and then it pops up. And then it burns like every, I think it was like three to four years, or maybe six to seven years naturally. Because lightning, or uh, fire, you know, Florida, I think, has, is the most lightning in the U.S. So there's a lot of lightning fires there, characteristically, in, on that whole floodplain. Um, Anyway, fire rotation, I, I looked at their plans, and I think they burn their entire national forest, I think it's every four to five years. So if you imagine that on Cleveland, it'd be where they're purposely burning the entire Cleveland national forest every four to five years. And they have to do that to, to manage it to the point where it should be. Um, that would be the correct uses of a fire rotation. I don't think our landscapes really have a fire rotation appropriately in the West. I just don't think it's really that applicable. But in other areas, you do. Um, and then the fire return interval, see, it's important and related to, well, like I said, it's related to the vegetative life cycles. In other words, a plant has evolved over tens and thousands of year, tens and thousands of years or longer, and again, I'm not debating evolution, but it's evolved with that characteristic fire return interval, and it's used to that characteristic fire return interval. And if you mess with that, you're messing with the zen of that plant, right? You're messing with its well-being. It needs to have that fire within a certain interval, otherwise it can't survive, um, or at least it survive well. There's a term I'm going to introduce here called truncated, and truncated just means cut off. So if it needs 25 years, well, I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain it here. Uh, again, in general, with fire return interval, if you have too short, and again, this is, these are generalities, if you have too short of a fire return interval, reproduction strategies are affected, Invasive species often find a way in. So if you're getting too much fire on the landscape, this is happening in Southern California where we have too much fire. We're getting a lot of invasive species that are coming in and finding a niche. A niche is just a term that means um, just, a, I guess, a place for a plant to exist. You know, uh, a, a place where a plant role. is comfortable. What's that? A specific role. Yeah, maybe a role for a plant. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. So if there was one plant that got extirpated for some reason, another man might come in and, and find that niche. Uh, and then, again, in general, if you have too much fire, which is too short of a fire return interval, you get fire-driven conversion away from the historic vegetation. Or fire is, there's so much fire on the landscape that it's forcing the stuff that's always existed there off the landscape. Make sense? If you have too long, in general, if you have too long of a fire return interval, in other words, if you haven't had enough fire, which is, what's that, that's happening in a lot of the West, right? Characteristically, this like Southern California. This is one of the places where there's this is going on. It's Southern California, um, but in most of the rest of the West, you have a too long of a fire return interval. Again, the reproduction strategies are affected because some species need fire. Aspen is a good example. Aspen, you guys all seen aspen on the landscape, right? Aspen needs fire every once in a while, but like every 80 years or so, it doesn't burn until every once in a while you get to. Uh, that 80 year mark and then um, a fire will come through and it'll regenerate. It'll kill all the top stems and it'll regenerate. But if you don't get, have enough fire, what's happening in, in many places across the west with the aspen is you're getting conifer encroachment into it. So you're getting conifer trees like lodgepole pine, dog fir, subalpine fir. They're coming in and then they're taking over that same acre that the aspen traditionally or characteristically held and the aspen just dies out and then all of a sudden you have a conifer stand. Make sense? 
So that's why, like I showed you the pictures of that project where we went and cut out all the conifers and burned it, and because we were choosing the aspen, um, we were trying to help the aspen out. We were, in effect, restoring the aspen stand, right? So anyway, and again, you can get uh, a fuels accumulation, which is what's happening all across the West. Not enough fire, get fuels accumulation. And then a vegetative conversion away from the historic vegetation. Again, just like, a, like that example I just gave you with the aspen and the conifer, that's what historic, that's what conversion away from historic vegetation is. Is that you're getting vegetation that's coming in and occupying sites that traditionally didn't. Another example of that is this juniper sagebrush interaction that I've talked about where sagebrush is maybe burns every, yeah, it depends, maybe 20 to 40 years. Sage, uh, western sage, um, like that big sage, you guys all been in Nevada and Idaho and places, you've seen that sagebrush out there. Um, that burns everywhere, it's pretty responsive, it, it's not like grass, like you can't burn it every few years, it has to have a fire free interval, but it responds well to fire, whereas the juniper that's in there doesn't respond well to fire, fire kills it fairly easily, And uh, but if you don't have enough fire, the juniper will come in and come in and take over and eventually it'll get rid of the, the sage, the sage drops out, okay? So that's what that means. So this is just a chart of some, uh, a grab bag of uh, fire return intervals. I got this from this book by Phil Omi, which is called Forest Fires, I think. Great book, really good book, really accessible. It really breaks down a lot of the concepts of fire and fuels management. Um, it's really cool. So it just talks about, so fire return interval for alpine tundra in New England. So alpine tundra just means like that northern tier, the northern tier of the United States uh, in New England. Thousand year fire return interval. Jeez. Might be a thousand years between fires and areas. Um, they might not even be sure, but you know, so really, really long. Uh, white spruce in the Yukon, you know, they'll pour these, they'll look at this stuff 200 years. Um, logical pine, we keep talking about logical pine in Montana, 25 to 150 years. Uh, and on down the line. So interesting. Okay, so longleaf pine. We talked about longleaf pine. I give that example where you get a lot of. Longleaf pine ecosystems down in southern Georgia, southern Mississippi, and Alabama, and Florida. Um, three years. If you're looking for fire, and again, this is characteristic. This is what they think the, the, the characteristic fire return interval is. Mixed conifer or sequoia in, about, in the Sierra is 10 to 100 years. That's quite a spread, but it can handle it. Um, chaparral, uh, this is, I guess, 20 to 50 years for evergreen chaparral, deciduous chaparral, 30 to 100. What is the difference between evergreen and deciduous chaparral? So evergreen chaparral is, think of your chemise. That's a perfect example of an evergreen one, right? Because it's, it's got those leaves that it retains year-round. An evergreen, I'm sorry, the, the deciduous one would be something more like your California sage, something that drops its leaves as a water conservation strategy. Okay. So deciduous is a term that applies to anything that drops its leaves. So all the oak and hickory forest and everything. And you guys notice the black oaks in Laguna and Palomar, that's all, those are deciduous trees versus, like say, the live oaks, which are um, evergreen trees. Uh, see, prairie, I like how they put a year. So these prairie glades in Missouri, a year. It's supposed to burn every year. I don't think that's probably sustainable, but maybe, maybe it gets a fire every year. It's not sure. It's more like two to five years. Yeah. Again, this is from Phil, so I, whatever. And then I like this tropical rainforest. You're, uh, here you go, man. What is? Unknown. It's always wet. It's always wet. But that's why, right? So they literally, they don't know what the fire return interval is. But again, going back to a thesis, in that book that I talked about, World Fire by Stephen Pine, he talks about all the ecosystems, even Antarctica. And his thesis in that book, you don't have to read it. I'll tell you what the thesis is. It's that every ecosystem burns eventually. Everything burns eventually. There will be a fire. That's an easy stance to take, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, when you're writing the book, I guess so. <laughs> well, 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 that happens, I don't know. 10,000 years from now, check it out. <laughs> we don't even need to get any climate change. But this is just a table. So you can see that fire return interval is clearly related to the ecosystem. They are, I don't know what's the word, they are, they are linked. They are dependent upon each other. And, and you have to understand what you're in to understand this, to then understand how to manage it. Remember we're land managers, that's why we're here. So we, 
Remember G.I. Joe? No one is half the <laughs> Yes. No one is half the battle. You have to know this stuff. Okay. And if you don't know, you look it up in a book, you look it up in a paper, you look it up in FEIS, you look it up whatever, you call somebody that knows. Okay, all right, moving on. We're still talking about fire return interval? Good God. Yeah, it's good. almost like it's important or something. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about this. Don't get scared by this. This is, uh, they have these, they introduce this classification. And this is where it gets cool because they start breaking it down. You have short, medium, and long fire return intervals. But they're also introducing this truncated short, truncated medium, and truncated long fire return interval. Oh my god, what does that mean? Truncated short or short? Let's, let's break it down. So he's saying all the fire return intervals are one of these six. In a truncated fire return interval, in other words, a fire regime whose fire return interval is truncated, it means that their systems, the fire regime, the ecosystem is not resilient to a departure from the characteristic fire regime. In other words, if it needs 25 years, by God, it needs 25 years. And if it's 50 years, that's catastrophic. Or if it's five years, that's catastrophic. It needs 25 years. And there's some plants out there that just plain need it in order to continue propagating and in order to continue functioning properly. You get that? That's the name of the game? Okay. So truncated systems that experience fire outside of that results short or long, and it can be short, it can be long, okay? Outside of that 25 years that it wants, results in a type change. In other words, it goes away. It just, it can't handle it, says, I'm out, taps out, it goes, it leaves the ecosystem. Um, if it's a non-truncated system, by the way, it's not called non-truncated, it's just called short, medium, or long, but we're not using that term truncated. It, it's like, eh, I would really prefer my fire regime, my fire return interval. I would really prefer that. But it's cool if you come in short. It's cool if you go long. Okay, you can handle a little bit of departure. Nothing can handle that forever, but it can handle it. it can, there's more resiliency. So you see the difference? There's some that are very narrow about what they want in their fire return interval, and there's some that are, are cool doing something a little bit longer. You guys good? Do we need a couple jacks? All right. All right. Cool, guys. All right. Keep it up. So a truncated short fire return interval. So truncated short. All of the area burns in a short fire return interval. The whole area, all of it, burns regularly. This is sometimes uh, a good example. This is a naturalized ecosystem. Does anybody know what naturalized means? Go back to the way it was. Self-sustaining? Self, uh, nope, not that either. Well, it, well, it becomes self-sustaining. A naturalized ecosystem means one that has come in and it didn't exist before, but now it exists. Uh, For a instance, norm. a new norm. That's a good way of putting it. Cheap grass <laughs> is a naturalized <laughs> ecosystem. Or is an, yeah, well, that really is an ecosystem unto itself. Uh, we have nat what we call naturalized species such as black mustard. You guys remember black mustard? That's, we see it all over the place. Wild oats. Um, what's that other one? Never remember. Anyway, there's, there's species. Smooth bromes are really common. Yeah, there's a lot of bromes, right? That's a good one. So there's a lot of species that are what's called naturalized. But then you can have a whole ecosystem that's naturalized. And I'm going to say cheatgrass. You guys familiar with cheatgrass at all? Especially in the Great Basin. You get cheatgrass is just this annual grass. It's about that tall. We have a little bit of it here, but not like they have. You get a thousand acre fire, you'll come back in the next year with a thousand acres of cheatgrass. That is a naturalized ecosystem because the only thing there, and then those areas require a short fire return interval because those species, um, if, it, if there's no more fire, eventually they'll go away. Okay, so that's a truncated short. Again, an interruption of that short fire return intervals allows species conversion. A woodlands are an example, and these that frequent fire, uh, meadows, and grasslands. So grass is sort of like a very the best example you can think of something like this. But a, sh a regular old short fire return interval, you guys are going to get this pattern, I think. Most of the area burns with the short fire return intervals, but eventually there'll be some longer intervals. Again, that's just a variation that does not mean that the dominant overstory, the dominant overstory plant will go away. Ponderosa pine is a good example of this. Ponderosa pine is that, remember, fire regime one, frequent fire, low severity, wants to see fire about every 10 years. 
but there are plenty of examples of ponderosa pine that even though it wants to have a fire every 10 years, won't see a fire maybe every 30, 40 years. It, when a fire burns through ponderosa pine that hasn't been there, that hasn't seen a fire in 40 or 50 years, it's not the same as 10 years. It'll blow holes in the canopy a little bit, right? Um, it might kill a few more trees, but by and large, after that fire, it's still going to be a ponderosa pine ecosystem. Okay? That's the variability. And then that resets it. And then it's going to hope that it gets back to that 10 year interval. If it goes another 30, well, it might not love that, but it's still probably going to be okay. Probably still going to be a ponderosa pine ecosystem. But if that keeps happening, then you're eventually going to have issues. But for the most part, it can handle it. Are you too hot? Susie, a little warm. Alright, I'm sorry, it's hard to get this. It's okay. Right. Are you guys good? Are you hot? All right. All right. I know when you get hot, you're like falling asleep, and this is pretty dry material in here, right? It's exciting, but I'm excited. She's so excited that she's real. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna faint? I've never made anybody faint so far, so that would be pretty rash. <laughs> Something to shoot for. <laughs> All right. So, do you guys understand this difference between truncated? Truncated, you have to hit it on target, or else it's gonna go away. Yeah, right. And then the other ones have a little leeway either way. Yeah, exactly. So truncated. So we'll go through this. Truncated medium, the same as truncated short. But the only difference is that it's a, it's a, it's a medium time period, right? See the difference? 40 to 60 years. Um, so that's not the same as, what was the last one? Yeah, it doesn't say, but whatever. 40 to 60 years. So that's in the middle. And um, again, a mi if you miss that fire return interval, it's going to be freaking problems. Um, some examples, which I think are great examples, and I'm going to try to explain this, is uh, Tecate cypress and some of the cypress species. This is relevant to here. Are you guys familiar with... Um, it's Tecate in Cuyamaca and, and Guatai. Right, Guatai Mountain has what, what kind of Tecate cypress, right? So Guatai Mountain has Tecate cypress. The cypress species overall, and then there's another one on Otai, but whatever. The cypress species are these species that are very much a truncated species, uh, system where they, um, so fire burns through, Cypress drops its cones. I think it might even be semi serotonous Drops its cones, and it cannot have fire again until those spe the cypress trees, which are living in the chaparral, for the most part, are living in the chaparral, until the tree comes up. I think it's like 20, 30 years. And well, maybe it's longer. It, it grows up, reaches sexual maturity, puts more cones on, then it can have a fire. But the problem, too, with it on the backside is that if you wait too long, the the seed viability goes down, and so that when a fire does come through, the seeds just go, I'm too old. So it really is linked to that chaparral, which is the carrier of the fire, right? Because there's never like a Tecate cypress grow fire, you know, naturally. It's always linked to the chaparral that's around it, um, which again makes me think chaparral is something like 50 year fire return interval, something like that. Um, so it has to have that. If you introduce, and if, if, a, if the cypress trees are, they all get burned off, they're grown up, say they're like 15 years old, if another fire comes through there and burns them up, it's done. There might be a few seeds here and there, but for the most part, you're going to lose that stand. Um, there are stands on the Cleveland where the, it's, it's somewhere within that range. Um, there's a lot of stands that burned over on the cedar fire that right now, if a fire burns through there again in the next 20, 30 years, you're going to lose those stands. Um, the Tribuco actually has some. Um, what is the species up there? Well, I don't remember, but I know there's a few of them because I've had to uh, protect them before. Yeah. The well, they're very important. They're up in that, uh, I want to say like water canyon, those that are coal canyon? Coal yeah, canyon. It is the Tecati that's up there. Is it Tecati? Yeah, I was just going through some spatial okay. data. Okay. So there's, there's species like this around. So as a firefighter or a fire manager or an IC or whatever, this might be something, like if you know about it, it might be something that you can factor in. You probably won't. I mean, I probably wouldn't even. But, you know, standing here is easy to say. Yeah, they did. We did structural protection on the... See, that's freaking, that's awesome that you took that into account because, you know, this is an ecological functioning thing, and, and those species are very much at risk uh, because, of, because of this truncated medium fire return interval that Cypress has. We stand to lose those species. Again, as humans, 
you know, our society values <laughs> hanging on to stuff like this, especially if we knew that we know if we've screwed it up in the first place, which we, we have by and large with high return intervals. So, um, yeah, that's great. I've heard that story actually before that they've actually done protection on those, on those species. Um, and then at some point when they're ready to burn, I guess we can let it burn. And in fact, it, it'll need it, right? Um, and then there's other closed cone species. A cypress is a... Is a cypress a closed cone species? I guess, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's knob cone pine and Monterey pine, which by the way, when I was up in San Luis Obispo last year, if any of you guys are taking RX310, this year we're going to go look at some knob cone and some Monterey pine, which is the same sort of thing. It's a truncated medium. Um, fire return interval, it needs it at a certain time period, but it needs this, uh, afterwards, it needs some time to recover. Everybody clear on that? Yeah, you got to understand this stuff, especially like when you're putting in prescribed fires or whatever, you know, you need to look at this stuff. So again, with medium, most of the area burns at a medium interval, deviations, even strong ones, usually does a result in conversion. One of the examples they give here is chaparral. So chaparral is actually a great example where, say 35 years, it, it, can, it can do all right if it burns regularly, but it also, chaparral is totally cool being 300 years old. It doesn't matter, you know, it'll, it'll, it can sustain that. Um, live oak forest and then upper mountain hay is what it says. Again, with the medium, it's like, you know, once that interval, but deviations are okay. Truncated long, the, the, the interval that Neil and those guys gave was 70 years, which is lower than some of the other long intervals. Uh, in the truncated long, fires occur uh, outside of that range, usually results in conversion to another one. Um, let's see, what is it? Typical of areas with short seasons. So, like, remember I talked about that, like, five, six week growing season? This is typical of those areas. Um, these are species not adapted to fire. Uh, I like this example where you both have both high elevation and deserts. So, deserts, um, I'm not an expert on this. I know you talked a little bit about this. There are some ecosystems, right? Almost every ecosystem requires a little bit of fire. But it wants it within a very narrow window, and I guess deserts and some deserts are in this, and then high elevation ecosystems. Um, white bark pine and bristlecone pine, I think of both of those are very high elevation species, especially the bristlecone, which is interesting. Are you guys familiar with bristlecone pine? That's on the top of the White Mountains on the Inyo National Forest. These are the oldest trees on Earth. Yeah, they think, right? They don't even know for sure. Um, but yeah, that's the bristlecone pine, the Methuselah trees and all this. A tree that is that long lived is, is uh, maybe fire is part of their system, but it can also um, probably needs it within a very narrow window. Unless that tree is actually hit by lightning, it's, it's really hard because <laughs> I know I've seen yeah. quite a bit of these up on the Rockies and the habitat that it grows in, it's like, oh, here's a tree coming out of the talus slopes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, 300 yards that way, there's another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what was interesting is, um, I was up on the lake fire this year, you guys on the lake fires? You guys up north, up on, were anybody in the wilderness of the lake fire, which was on the San Bernardino National Forest? 10,000 foot ridge. 10,000 foot ridge. Were you guys up there with me? We, oh, you guys came in after I left, I guess I got booted. Well, those bristle clones. Because my team left. Uh, you were there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, those aren't bristle cones. What's up there? White fur, I think. It's not high enough for bristle cones. But what was interesting, like you talked about the talus and the trees, that, that fire, and we remember four years drought, that fire burned up until there was literally nothing left to burn. I mean, it, and it burned through these talus slopes, all the hundreds of years of little bits of bark and pine cones and rat middens and whatever else, literally hundreds of years, it freaking burned through all of that. Like I woke up in the morning a few times, I was like, how the hell did they get a fire to that? So it burned through all that talus so caught a few like super like old logs, it burned the log, hit granite rock face. It literally burned until it couldn't burn anymore. I, I was like, this is so cool. Because it's it's showing this it's showing a four year drought. We had an ignition, of course it was a human ignition, right? So it wasn't a natural fire or characteristic fire. But um anyway, it's just interesting to see that you can get these conditions where like, I'm like, 10,000 feet, it's June, and it's nuking everything. This is crazy. This is not typical. This is not characteristic. Something's going on, whether it's climate change or drought or whatever. Anyway, all right, sorry for the tangent. You know, it was cool. That was really cool. I have to show some videos, but you guys are up there. Uh, so then long, again, 70 years. Again, fires can burn within it, but they usually, um, uh, what does it say? 
okay. Burn with them. They're usually small in size. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Desert Scrub, Jeffrey Pine, whatever. It doesn't matter. You guys get the point of this. You guys understand the difference between truncated and then regular non-truncated? Who does not? No. Yep. Is it good? Mm -hmm. All right, copy. It's got to be uh, <laughs> Joe doesn't hit. <laughs> it's cool. I want you guys to get it. Um, all right. I just don't want to belabor that. And I hate this. But this is a, I want you guys to look at this. Um, take a little time. Here. It has the six. It has the six. And, you know, I looked at this and it just, it just doesn't make sense to me, some of it. So on the x-axis, you have the years, right? So zero to 100 years. And then you have proportion of area burned zero to one, which is the zero to 100%. Um, what's the best one I like to look at? I like to look at this one, which is truncated, or which is long. Uh, let's look at this curve here. All this is saying is that, remember where it was about 70 years, where you start to get the most of it? Mm -hmm. It's saying that you have fires in this less than 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You have them, but most of your fires, or, or rather most of the area burned, because mm -hmm. remember it's area burned on that side, is going to happen in the, at the later stages. So you really, you need probably like a series of small fires down here. But once you get here, then you get to where most of it can burn. And again, this isn't at 100%. It's just, and this is what I don't get, because I would actually think that all of this, but maybe all of this curve under here adds up to 100%. Maybe it doesn't. It doesn't matter. But you understand the point of this? Is that once this comes out here, once you get to about 70 years, then you're burning more of the area. It needs to get to this point. Think of this as a fuel accumulation curve. For a tr or for a long ecosystem, and again, remember with long, it's not truncated, so it can have this long tail where it's cool. All right, no worries. I can have some fires earlier. I don't mind that so much, and I would be willing to bet that this curve just continues out, where you know it, it reaches maybe a couple hundred years, and it's still fine with that. Is everyone following that? Let's look at the exact opposite of that, which would be like truncated short. Yeah. This is a very steep curve. So within 20 years, and the curve does not pick up ever on the other side, ever. It's all within 20 years. This is where it wants to be. If you're burning outside of this, problems on the ecosystem. Problems in the ecosystem, right? This is what it wants. And then again, <coughs> okay, the short is the highest of the proportion area burned, um, because what it's saying is that most of the area burns within this 20 years. And then you can look at these other curves where you have, um, I think these two, are the medium and the truncated medium. So the truncated medium is a very defined curve here. It wants all the fires from 20 to 75 years. Whereas the medium has approximately the same one, but it can have a tail out here, out to 90 years. It's fine, no big deal. Or even even earlier, it can have you know a fire. It can sustain a fire out here. Everyone make does that make sense? Okay. So that's what those curves are. Whenever you see a graph like this and you're like, oh my god, which like I, every time I see this I'm like, oh my god, what does this mean? Just take one part of it and see what does this mean, okay? Just, just bite it off very slowly um, and then try to make sense of it. And you know, if you ever get to a point where it just doesn't make any sense at all, you know, ask somebody. But that's my advice to you guys when you see stats and graphs and stuff like that. Just look at one small part of it and then start breaking it down from there, okay? That's just some advice. I, I use that advice every time. And I think, Lisa, you did a good job in your presentation of breaking that down, too. Um, and then again, truncated long, or uh, yeah, truncated long is the opposite mm -hmm. of the short. Of the short, if you notice that. And then you start to see these patterns, and then it really starts to come together for you. Okay, moving on. So, spatial, so moving on, this is still under the spatial category. Now we're moving to size. We're finally getting away from the fire return interval. The size, simply the size of the fire inside the perimeter. Um, it's not necessarily the total amount area burned. In other words, you might have a 100-acre fire, but how many of you guys have seen this? Only 70 acres of it actually burned. That happens all the time, right? Areas get missed, islands, whatever. That's the mosaic. What influences that mosaic? Like, what creates mosaics on there? In fires, what have you seen? What creates a mosaic? What creates islands? Fuel continuity. Fuel continuity, definitely. Things can just get missed. Right? Everyone's burning through. Topo, yeah, barrier. Moisture. Fuel moisture, maybe it's in like a riparian area or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that is making me nervous. Did you say ideological variant? I said meteorological. 
Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were getting deep on me there. Maybe it's sheltered from the wind? Yeah, all those things. Fire is complicated. I feel like I need to throw a joke in here or something. It's fading on me. Come on. All right. Is this changing? Of course it's changing. Uh, so size, fire regimes have characters of fire sizes. No. All right, let's wrestle. Oh, dude, right what? What did I do? Chief versus chief. <laughs> Some chief on chief action. <laughs> Juice that I got, dude. <laughs> I'm eating espresso beans and drinking coke. I'll take you on. All right. Uh, what? Okay. So anyway, for the new framework fire regime, they're small. He breaks it up. They break it up into small, medium, and large fires. 25 acres, 20, 2500, 20. 20 it doesn't really matter. This is just part of it. So when you're, this will matter more and later when we break it down, I'm losing my batteries. Um, so we discover that this has a laser on it. And we have cats, and we have this ancient cats. Like we've had cats longer than we've been married. I think we've been married for 13 years now. And this one cat, we discovered that she likes to play with lasers again. So at home, like my batteries on this thing have been dying. So that's what I was for you. Yeah. Thank you, cat. <laughs> Thank you, cat. <laughs> it's fun, man. See an old cat try to do new cat stuff. I can't wait till they die so we can get a dog. Okay. That got real. That got real in a hurry, didn't it? Bring it back. So now we're talking about spatial complexity. This is a spatial variability. What does spatial variability mean? That's a fancy term, right? The possible areas it could be in? Um. Hmm. This is a spatial variability. Let's try that one again. Spatial variability. So what's spatial mean? Variables in the area. What's that? It varies in size. The spatial is the area, right? Space in between. Ladder fuels? The fuels. Could be ladder fuels. Or yeah, this, these or things or factor into it. All the variables within the area. Yeah. Spatial variability of fire sparing. <laughs> so we know what variability means, right? Differences. Spatial, let's say that the fire is this room. The spatial is the area of this room, right? This, this footprint. So within the area of this room in a fire, there's going to be variability. Say it's uh, just a timber stand. Okay, so this is nuked out over by Aaron, over by Jim. It's not even touched. You guys are kind of in between. As you move from that side of the room across the room, that's the variability. In this area that we've chosen, again, you have to have some kind of boundary to bound that area. Usually it's the fire perimeter. And then what they look at is they look at that, that what they call spatial variability. It just means the variability across that area of fire severity. Cool? Make sense? Okay, so there's four categories. There's low spatial complexity. Uh, which means the fire burned uni uniformly. Low spatial complexity, which means it's not very complex. Which means it all did the same thing. It nuked thick grass. A uh, few unburned islands, which means there's, there's, no, there's nothing left, right? Uh, chaparral burns that way a lot of times, although it, there's definitely some variability in chaparral. And then grasslands are a good example of that. Moderate spatial complexity. Uh, you know, do the math, they're fairly uniform, but there's a little more complexity, a few more unburned islands, a few more logs left over. High spatial complexity uh, burns very complexly. Uh, it's a very deep fire. It's very complex. It's the emo of fires. <laughs> uh, areas of unburned next to high stand mortality. What's going on here? I don't understand, right? So uh, mixed conifers, sequoia forest. Think of that. Yeah. Uh, Susie, I think you brought ladder fuels, right? So you have some areas where ladder fuels, you know, the fire got up in the crowns, so other places it skipped right by, there's rocks, there's barriers. And what's the last one? Uh, multiple, right? Is that the four? Yeah, multiple spatial complexity. Which is, I don't even know, it just contains both complex burn severity and low burn severity. So, yeah. It's just really complex, I guess. Uh, well, maybe there's two distinct patterns to the fire. So one was, Oh, yeah. Complexity burned all this way, and then the other side was more high complexity and it burned a different way. So then maybe that's what the multiples supposed to get. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Should, yeah, that's, per that's a good example. Everybody follow that? 
you know, areas where it's complex and areas where it's not. Okay, uh, and that really, so, and what drives that, of course, is just the makeup of the stand. Like, the example here is heavy mixed understory, which just means it's really complex, a lot of logs. Next to areas, it's really simple, like a grassy area, or like a glade or something, where it's going to burn through completely. Okay, then you have fire line intensity. Most folks should be pretty familiar with fire line intensity. We've been hearing this ever since 190, 290, right? It's the measure of energy released on the fire. It's just how hot the fire is in BTUs. We use it in firefighting all the time, um, and it it's related to suppression efficacy, which suppression efficacy just means the ease of suppressing the fire, um, the efficiency of suppressing the fire. So if we have a very high suppression efficacy, that means that we're very good at putting out fires, right? Versus a low. I could have inserted a joke there, but I held myself <laughs> back. Because <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, three O's nothing left. Okay. And uh, N F F R in the new frameworks uh, applied into four categories. It's just low, medium, high, and then multiple. It's so complex. So low, medium, high fire intensity, 48 foot. It's basically the hauling chart is what this is. Um, yeah, greater than 500 BTUs a square foot, which is pretty easy to get. <coughs> Everyone follow that one? Okay. Severity. Severity is important. This is severity and fire return interval, I'd say, are probably the two most important metrics that really go into determining uh, a fire regime. So follow me on severity. You guys fall asleep after that. Perhaps it's not important. Well, actually, it is. So. <laughs> severity is the magnitude of the effect that fire has on an ecosystem. So. Very simply, a fire occurs, I don't know how to put this simply, how bad is it? Okay? So if it's a very severe fire, and that's, you know, there's gradients even between that, but if it's a very severe fire, let's say, oh my god, it's, it's nuked, or whatever. That's ignoring the fact that some stands actually need to be nuked, and that's a good thing, but to simplify it, that's what it means. Um, and severity can be applied across different metrics. Um, so severity is not just severity. Severity is soil severity. It's habitat severity, vegetation severity. What do I mean by that? Soil, habitat, vegetation severity. What does that mean to you? Like when it's new, the soil gets new as well. So it's affected on a um, severe scale. I mean, just like it, it, it's just overall, it's in the, like, in the 90th percentile. I don't know how to really explain it. It doesn't matter what you're saying. Yeah, it's really affecting the soil. Like a high severity would really be affecting it. Uh, what do you think about like habitat severity? What would that be related to? Really? What do you think? Just like the area itself, like how uh, it gets it gets affected. In other so who? What's using the habitat? Animals. Animals, right? Animals require habitat. There's also plant habitat, but we don't need to get into that. So you're you're combining the habitat, which is where they live, with the severity, right? So how then do the animals relate to? What what do you think would be the effect of an animal that had a high habitat severity? Would that animal be happy? No, could live there. Probably not, right? Because there would be a high or order of magnitude affecting it. Versus a low severity fire, would that animal be like, all right, cool, whatever, you cleaned up the grass, you cleaned up the lawn. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So again, you can relate that across soil, habitat, vegetation severity. Mostly, if people don't actually take the time to define this, when they say severity, they're relating to, or rather they're referring to vegetation severity. Which is um, also known as burn severity. And you see these on the maps a lot. Oh, the burn severity on a map um, or on a fire. Sometimes you even see these maps at fire camp. Um, which is really, so in vegetation severity, it's talking about how much were the plants affected. And this is something we talk about in fire effects. And um, so if you have a fire that comes through and the stand pretty much looks like the stand that was there before, like, for instance, if it was a ponderosa pine stand and a fire burned through it and you walk in and you're like, this is a ponderosa pine stand, then that's a low severity fire. Mm -hmm. how, you got, how many times have you guys ever walked into a stand and you have no idea what the trees were? Maybe. Have you guys ever had that? More or less? I mean, maybe you had an idea, but I've walked into plenty of stands and I'm like, that's cool. I can kind of tell there was trees here in the past. <laughs> maybe. But... If you really want to try to identify those trees, you really got to like go up to them, maybe look at the bark patterns, or what. you might even need to look at a map 
You're like, what the hell was here before? That would be a high burn severity. That is what gets mapped a lot of times, and then other times, and then people will look at soil severity and habitat severity, but most of the time what they're looking at is vegetation severity. What the effect is to that ecosystem, or what the effect is to the vegetation. Again, the, the downstream effects of that will be too determined. It might be that the, the, the stand wants to, to be that way. And for instance, chaparral is a great example. Unless you knew there was chaparral before in summer, and if it slicks off a hillside, you'd have no idea that there was eight foot tall brush there before. Which is kind of interesting, right? That's why there's so much smoke produced from chaparral fires, is because so much of that biomass is being converted into to gas and heat and everything. Um, but that would be high burn severity. But does chaparral hate that? Yeah. Chaparral wants to be nuked up. Well, he hates it initially, right? <laughs> Characteristically. Well, Don't hurt me. I know. Uh. It's for the good of the order. Okay. You guys following me? So there's low severity, which is light or no modifications in the vegetation. Makes sense, right? Low severity, not much of an impact. Moderate severity, most of the plants survive. Small areas of high and low, kind of a mix. And then there's high severity. Of course, the fire kills most of the vegetation above the surface. And many of the plants uh, survive under the surface. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this before, but a lot of plants, what's above the soil, and I'm going off and over here, I suppose, but what's above the soil a lot of times is not really per se the plant. It's just the above ground portion of the plant. A lot of times you really want to look at the root system and that carbohydrate store is sort of like the heart and the brain and the lungs of the plant. And it can survive without that top because it'll just sprout back up. A lot of chaparral plants are like that, oaks, and there's a lot of species that are fine if you burn off the top. Aspen, another example, where you kill off that top, it doesn't care. It's just like the hair. You shave your head, and it's just going to grow back. Um, it's if you kill that root system, then you're actually killing the plant. Now, that's, there's a lot of variation to that, but just take that at face value. There's very high severity. I like high severity and very high severity. I wish there was like an ultra high severity <laughs> or like uber severity, but it's not. It's just very high. Stand replacing. All of it's done. It's done. Lodgepole when it burns, it nukes. Hemlock when it goes, it goes. And chaparral when it goes, it goes. And then there's multiple severity. I, everything here is like multiple in this. So you have fires at both low and very high. Um, maybe across the same area. We have areas of very high and areas of low. Make sense? That's severity. This is a severity map. This is, again, burn severity. Uh, you can't really see this, but on the bottom there's, so there's like gray or whatever this is. What is that? Low. Yellow is moderate, and I'm assuming that's red is high. Right? So then you look at this map. I think this is the Angora fire. You have, so see these areas of red? That's newt. Uh, yellow is that moderate burn severity. And then I don't know if there's any low or not. Is there low? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a little bit of low. So it's mostly a moderate to higher burn. So this is a pretty impacted ecosystem, I guess. Well, actually, we don't. I mean, I think this is timber, so I'm going to assume it's not loving life too much. But, uh, you know, it's pretty mixed, but you definitely have areas where they've made it set up a big run here. Maybe, maybe there's a drainage, I don't know. But that's what a burn severity map looks like. Oh, and I think it, this is just a little closer. Enhance. Woo! What? <laughs> Enhance. It's enhanced. Enhance. 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 <laughs> what is that from? Super Yeah, Super Troopers. What? Super Troopers. Super Troopers. Don't pretend like I haven't seen that movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beneath me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was probably reading Shakespeare that day. Okay, <laughs> 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 I think I got negative, negative ten points. Negative ten points, Lauren. Got it. He's <laughs> still reeling really back. Fire type, okay, so this is easy. Fire type is the description of the pattern of the flaming front, and it's whatever. It's the type of fire. We use this all the time and must be used accurately to portray proper information. All I'm trying to say is know what the hell you're talking about when you, when you say fire type. This is something we hammer into our, uh, our rookies so that when they're on the other end of the radio for the first time and they're like, it's crowding! <laughs> and it's, you know, I don't know. Group 14 spot. or a spot. Yeah. Smolder, <laughs> smoldering spot, yeah. Smoldering <laughs> spot. <laughs> so this is where, and when we very patiently go over to them and we say, you need to use accurate information to portray proper information about a fire type. <laughs> Yo, Mr. Bucus. That is not crowning. Anyway, surface fire, passive crown fire. 
Uh, there's different types, surface fire, passive crab fire, uh, what is it up to, so this is just talking about the area um, that will experience these difference. Um, so you guys understand the difference between passive crab fire and active crab fire? Remember that from 290? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Alright, what is it then? Passive, as it needs a surface fire to keep it going. Passive needs a surface fire to keep it going? Active is on its own. Uh, and then there's independent. And that's independent. Is yeah. what I'm passive is like torching. Yeah. Um, passive is torching. Active requires a surface fire. Yeah. yeah, I know you're good. You're just one category off. So active crown fire requires surface fire to sustain it. And independent crown fire is extremely rare. Uh, independent crown fire does not require uh, surface fire to sustain it. Um, that's where you can get like rerun potential and stuff like that. So anyway. Um, we have active independent crown fire, uh, chaparral, actually I guess it's not that rare, because, well, I don't know. Chaparral can be an independent crown fire, but most of the time you have a surface fuel load, right, to help sustain that. Um, you definitely do. Uh, let's see, and then of course multiple fire type, all of these, they always end with a multiple. Um, so it would be a fire type that gets classified that has both surface and crown. Uh, okay, so this is finally, we're getting to the end of it, we're tying it all together. So these are all the categories, right? Seasonality, FRI size, these are all those categories. And this is what it actually looks like. Remember how there's no categories? I mean, there's no fire regime 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, remember I said there's like a hundred different, different variations? So for Chaparral, the way you would describe Chaparral in the new framework fire regime, and this is why I like it so much, is that you have chaparral. Okay, seasonality. What is it? We know it's summer, fall. Fire return interval, we know it's moderate long. Size is moderate long. Spatial complexity is low, <coughs> characteristically. Less you. Less you. Intensity is high, severity low and high. You can have both. Fire type, active crowd. So this is what chaparral is defined as. Instead of saying fire regime 4, this is what the new framework fire regime says. Which one is a little more descriptive? Well, this one is, right? But remember how I said you need to understand these things a little bit more? You need to understand what all these are. Now, all of you are completely capable of understanding what these are and then finding this information. Um, it's just this is um, this is how what it looks like. So for big cone duck fur, um, I think I got this. I don't know. God, my brain is too fuzzy to try to explain this. Because big cone duck fur exists in chaparral. So summer, fall, same. Fire return intervals, the same. The size, it says, instead of moderate large, small to moderate, but then again, the stand sizes are a lot smaller, right? So a duck fur, I mean, the biggest duck fur stand you're going to see in the chaparral anyway is, you know, maybe a few acres. Of course, we're going to go up to the top of Palomar where there's like giant big cone duck furs, um, but whatever. Spatial complexity is high because when it burns through there, sometimes it'll nuke it all out, sometimes it'll just burn underneath it, right? So there's high spatial complexity. The intensity is low in a high mix because, again, you're getting both of those. But then you're back to severity, which is the same as chaparral. And then with the fire type, sometimes you're just going to get a surface fire creep through there. Sometimes you're going to pass the crown fire, which means you'll get some torching. And then sometimes the fire will just nuke it off. If you guys have ever seen that south slope of Palomar, you see a lot of those big cone dug fur stands where there was clearly an active crown fire that went through and killed those trees. And as you're driving up either south grade or east grade road tomorrow, look at those those trees off that south slope and you can see the crown fire that went through. It was big cone duck fur in an active crown fire scenario and a lot of those haven't come back. Okay. I have a question. Please. If you know in certain areas like what you're talking about where they're just kind of not going to come back, have you ever like replanted those same trees in those areas to try to help them come back? The big cone duck fur, I don't think they've done much. Mostly because it's really hard to get to those areas. And they expect there to be a response already. We've done some planting. We haven't done, to answer your question simply, we haven't done a ton of planting. Um, we have done some planting in some areas with very mixed success. What happens a lot of time in our places is you get like ceanothus and some things that come back, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. And the ceanothus just chokes things out. And what we've actually seen is the natural regeneration. It is the trees that are going to come back anyway are doing better on their own instead of the ones that we've planted. For instance, on the north end of Laguna Mountain, which is a lot like uh, San Jacinto, 
uh, we went in and planted a bunch of, I can't remember what it is, some pines. And they didn't do that well. They got choked out by the cenotes, and well, they weren't really maintained, but they just they just didn't very well. But what is coming back is the coulter pine. The coulter pine tends to be more of a pioneer species. A pioneer species is, it's, it's you know, like a pioneer is the first person to come in. Well, a pioneer species is like the first species to come in. Um, and the coulter pines do pretty well. They they handle dry, uh, dry conditions pretty well. They handle adverse conditions. So. They kind of are like the pioneers that are coming in. And the coulters are actually doing a lot better. And we've gone in and have, have, have favored them. So to answer your question, we've actually had better success with natural regeneration. But yeah, we've done a little bit. It's a good question. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about condition class here. Um, some people call it FRCC, but this is the CC. Remember how the FR was the fire regime? Well, this is the CC, which is condition class. Um, but it really uh, refers to the condition class part of it, not the fire regime. Um, and again, starting with successional theories, and this will make more sense in a minute. So condition class is a metric that we use. Again, national fire plan, came from the national fire plan. We use it with fire regimes. And what we use condition class for is we use to measure the now condition of a fire regime. We use it to measure the now condition of any part on the landscape. So the Guna Mountain is going to have a condition class associated with it. Uh, Palomar Mountain, the Chaparral, everywhere in America has a condition class that has been ascribed to it. It is a measure of where an ecosystem is related to the now. Oh my God, I wrote natural. Oh, I'm deducting 25 points for myself. <laughs> from the characteristic fire regime. Um, so, remember how I said we have a fire regime? We say this is the characteristic of what it should be. Well, the reality is it's not. And so we need a metric to determine how much of it is not. Or I should say how, how bad it is off from what it should be. And what we use is we use the term departure. So, if this hillside behind me has low departure from the historical fire regime, it means it's operating within that fire regime. It's good to go, it's happy. But a high departure from the historical fire regime means it's not happy. It's either way too much fire, way not enough fire, whatever. And then there's of course there's moderate departure, which is, you know, it's it's not super happy, but it hasn't hasn't left the building yet either. Can everyone follow on that? So this is a way that we, we know what we want in a fire regime. This is how we measure uh, how close it is to historical. Um, Again, we use departure because a departure means, you know, a moving away from something. It's moving away from the characteristic fire regime. Um, departure is measured with, uh, we look at the vegetation characteristics. In other words, we know on a landscape you're supposed to have uh, certain species that are supposed to be existing in a, certain, in a certain way. There's supposed to be so much chemise, there's supposed to be so much red shank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also look at what the well, the fuel composition, that's like the same thing. All right, ignore that. By the frequency of fire, so we can know what the historical uh, fire frequency is. We can know what the pattern is. Remember, severity, we talk about all these things. Uh, if we know something that's supposed to have low severity, but it's, it, it's hap it has high severity, we know that's a departure, we know that's a change. And then uh, if there's and other disturbances, sometimes this gets ignored, is that other disturbances such as insects, disease, grazing, drought, all these other inputs that can affect the ecosystem, if those, especially if they're a man-made uh, concern, would be would contribute to that disturbance. So, uh, and then one given area might contain multiple levels of departure. For instance, remember it all goes to like the size, like one acre of ground is probably gonna have one condition class. But if you look at a whole mountain, what's gonna happen across a whole mountain? In terms of spatial variability, varying condition classes. You're going to have varying condition classes. Why? It's not all the same. Why is it not all the same? Because it's an ecosystem. Why is it an ecosystem? Because it's variability. Because fire. Because you have different aspects. You have different fires. Say you have a whole mountain. Well, maybe one fire. Maybe one side of the mountain is by the road, right? And you keep getting fires that start off the goddamn road all the time, right? Well, the other side is up in the wilderness, and it never has enough fire, so it's, you know, it, it's also departing. Yeah, or maybe you say you have one area that's really easy to drive through and there's a fire station right there and there's a very proactive uh, fire engine and they go out there and they manage that and it's, it's looking great, they've done a prescribed burn, 
they've done their homework. So you can have all kinds of variability. Um, so condition class, the way it's actually measured is there's, it's a three-way measure. Uh, you have a condition class one, condition class two, and condition class three. Across these three, it has to equal 100%. So every landscape is going to equal 100% across these three. Make sense? Let's go through. Oh, my laser, my thing's dying here. So 30, 30, 40. Condition class one, condition class two, condition class three. So it goes along. Uh, in this slide, see how this is set up? That's the way it's read. That's the way it's reported. So if you're going to report this or you're going to read this, and this is actually something that has to get reported in our reporting database, facts, for every fuel treatment that we do. And uh, I'll make sure I come back to that point. So for 30, 30, 40, what is that telling you about the landscape of the ecosystem or whatever? 30% condition class 1, 30% condition class 2, 30 condition class 3. Okay, thank you. So 30 and 1, 30 and 4, uh, 32, 40 and 3. But what is it actually telling you about these? Well, it's kind of uniform across. No, they're, they're different. The they're, they're it's kind of uniform? But what's happening on that landscape? Changes are just variation. Yeah, well, there's variation because it's split across it. Any confused? Okay. Well, let's back up then. No, it's, it's totally cool, man. Uh, let's go back to this. So remember, condition class is a measure of departure from the fire regime. So you have a characteristic area. And it's broken up into three parts. Condition class one is is low, let's go back to this, low departure. Yeah, I don't think I did a good job of tying this together, so thank you. So one is low. One is low, is, yeah. yeah, so bad. Low departure is one, moderate departure is two, high departure is three. Thank you, that's probably very important. Yeah, so my bad. We'll go through some examples, and this will hammer it home for you. So now, are we all caught up now on that? Thank you. Guys, if you don't know something, if you're confused on it, please raise your hand. I'm seeing like scrunched up. Jose is really good because your eyes scrunch up and you <laughs> clearly look confused on things. I do that same thing, but I don't see that all the time. So please just mention, please just raise your hand uh, and I'll stop and we'll go back. Because like what just happened here, I'm not really familiar with this. I've been seeing this stuff forever. So sometimes I just don't think to tie this stuff in together. So help me out. Please help your students out with this. And I apologize for that. So again, 30, 30, 40, condition class one, functioning well, within the range of natural availability, which is called moderate departure, high departure. So again, what's going on in the landscape with that 30, 30, 40? Is it kind of transitioning? It could be. I mean, this is just some numbers, so we're making it up, but let's, let's I mean, reason it out. It could go from one way to another way. It could go from hypothetically low departure. Well, I guess it is going to high departure, because that's the most percentage we have, right? Yeah, 40% 40. 40 of it is so way out of variability. Maybe the way things are going, if it continues, it'll continue to rise on the high departure. Yeah. Hypothetically? Yeah, hypothetically. I mean, whatever, I'll go with your scenario, um, as long as it's reasoned out. I mean, it could be that uh, it was all bad and you did a fuels treatment and you brought some of it towards that way, right? Um, and so, I can't remember if I make this point in the next slide or not, but what we're managing for with the National Fire Plan, with fuels treatments and everything, is we're trying to manage to get everything to one, mm -hmm. to restore it back to one. Are we ever going to get there? Stop being so cynical. <laughs> Probably we're not. We're trying to eliminate at least the, the third category, right? At least the high really? departure. Yeah, we're at least trying to get it out of three. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. We'll probably never get there, but we're going to try. Or retire. Whatever. <laughs> okay, what's the next example? 80, 10, 10. What's this looking like? Party time. Party right, time. <laughs> Job ski. What's 80? Seriously, come on. Let's break it down. 80, 10, 10. What's, what's it telling you? Low departure is 80%. So, but what does the ecosystem look like, Susie? Is, is under 80-10-10. I know, I stopped. Uh, it's, it's closest to its original fire regime. Yeah. Yeah, it's looking pretty darn good is what it's looking like, right? Mm -hmm. We can deal with 10%. Like, if our whole west looked 80-10-10, we wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> We'd be good. Does that make sense? Make sense? Yeah, that's what we want it to look like. Well, we want it to look like 100 zero, zero. But 80, 10, 10 is pretty good. 0, 25, 75, what's that looking like? <coughs> oh boy. We're going to need some money. Not looking so good, right? 
Yeah, most of it is pretty jacked up and the rest of it's on its way. 1075, 15, whatever. You guys get the point? Mm -hmm. That's condition class. All right, measure it. 100, 0, 0. Cash award. Cash award. Fable <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, time. <laughs> zero, zero, 0,000. I like to hammer the stuff I need, so this is like walk away, it's never coming back. Okay. This is a condition class map of Palomar. I'm actually going to hand one out later. You got one. Condition class one is yellow, condition class two is blue, and condition class three is maroon? Brown. Brown? Whatever. Brown. You guys are robots, I can't tell. Alright, so what is the condition class generally in Palomar Mountain? This is from land fire data, by the way. So primarily in two. So what's that tell you about Palomar Mountain? It needs help. It needs help. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> no, it really is. It's a good way of putting it. It needs help. It's like it needs an intervention. It has a problem. <laughs> it needs somebody to step in and help it because it could either, you know. It's on the edge. That's a good point. That's right, man. Self-destructing. It could be self-destructing. It could be allowed to. Or we could try to bring it back, right? Yeah. And I don't think this map represents actual vegetation management activities because this, all these, see these black areas, this is the Fry Creek project that we're going to be looking at. Um, there's A lot of this area has been managed and this is what we actually own. But anyway, so this is what they look like. This is what a condition cost map looks like. Uh, I don't have the numbers, like what the percentage is, but what do you think the numbers generally would be across the three? 15, 70, whatever is left. <laughs> uh, 15. 15, 70. Math. Don't pay me to do math. 15, 15. <laughs> I have to write it out. Does anybody disagree that this is probably 1570, 15 or something? It's probably more. Any lower? Higher on the Yeah. All right. Whatever. You can actually do an empirical calculation of this and you'll spit it out. But it, so it doesn't it doesn't give you the departure either before of too much fire or too little fire, though, does it? Uh, it goes either way. Yes, so you have to understand what the ecosystem type is when you look at it. So it could either be too much fire or not enough fire. Both of those are departures from the norm. So it really is, I guess, a, a two-way from the zero variable or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, it goes either way. Uh, again, and you need to know what the ecosystem is and what that's looking like and how what it looks like now is a part of it. Yeah. So that area, though, that... It's kind of a mix of both, right? There wasn't enough at one point, and then it had omega type fires through that area, which snooped a lot of it. Yeah, a ton of CNO things. And you can see that on this. Well, a lot of that depends on what it was before. Yeah. Remember, because mm -hmm. say it's been a hundred years since a fire, mm -hmm. when it went through, well, okay, so that's fine. It's still within its range of variability. Uh, it's returning a little. But the fact of the matter is, see all this brown, all this three. A lot of this is actually those fires from 07. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I don't necessarily sure I agree with that because remember, if you're looking at the departures, I don't know what the fire is, but I know there's been fire history on that south slope of Palomar on the Highway 76 corridor. Again, you guys will see it. I know you all haven't seen it, but there's been a lot of fire through the years. So the Pumacha fire was just the last fire, and a lot of what you're seeing is that scar there. So, so you're right. Yeah, and that's because what I'm asking is if. Mm -hmm. Because at one point maybe there wasn't enough, so once we got fire in there, there was too much fire. Yeah. But now we have our east wind scenarios that are going to naturally yeah. burn at a higher intensity. And maybe not do what it would, would normally do the landscape, but because it's going to burn kind of... Well, yeah, a Santa Ana fire is not necessarily atypical. Uh, a Santa Ana fires are, are, are normal. The only problem we have with Santa Ana fires is that... Most of the time, Santa Ana's are supposed to come through without there being fire on the landscape. And then every once in a while, you would have a Santa Ana that would pick up a fire that existed on one of the islands, and it would blow across the landscape, but on a much longer interval than we're having now. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So Santa Ana's in themselves are not unusual. The fact that you had an ignition for a Santa Ana to pick up and blow across the landscape is what's different. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. All right, 
so that's condition class, and we're going to look at this uh, tomorrow. Then we have this other thing. I think this is we're coming we're coming to the end of it. I, my goal was to quit talking by around three thirty to give you guys time to talk. Is that going to work for your to do these projects? I'm not sure if you guys need that or not. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably be shooting for about quarter after. What's that? Okay. So then there's this other thing called fire return interval departure. This is kind of like condition class um, in a way, but it's, it's a different metric that got developed in California. I think it got developed in Yosemite specifically. Um, and it's a tool to show departure from the fire return interval. So you have a fire return interval, right? You have the natural uh, characteristic fire return interval. This is another way of showing the departure from that, and it goes in two directions. So it's either too much fire, not enough fire. Condition class, as CJ right, astutely pointed out, you can't tell from looking at this whether there's too much or not enough fire. It just tells you that it's departed. Mm -hmm. The FRID mechanism actually shows you uh, spatially, that is with colors or whatever, numerics, which way it goes. So uh, there's different ways to calculate it if you ever go into the GIS. The one that I use is the maximum condition class fire return interval, just for anybody that goes in and looks at it later. Um, again, it's not directly related to condition class, but it's, it's similar to it. It's similar in its function. Uh, let's see. Areas are given a score of minus to plus. If it shows a positive number, and this is what you need to remember, if it shows a positive number, it's not enough fire in the ecosystem, uh, which is kind of backwards, but whatever. So positive number, not enough fire in the ecosystem. Where are you going to see positive numbers, i.e. not enough fire in the ecosystem? Where are you going to see that in the Western United States? Uh, up north. What's that? Up north. Up north? Yeah. Near, near Wui areas, maybe? Possibly near Wui areas. Is this what you guys Wilderness. Wilderness. How about anywhere except for Southern California? Okay, up north. Yeah. <laughs> up north. <laughs> or east. Northeast. Yeah, okay, pretty much anywhere except for Northern California. Or uh, Southern California. Except where in Southern California, I think you might see a plus Frid. Del P? Del P? Yeah, I'm not sure what Del P never looked. Mm -hmm. How about the Cleveland? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh there's the hint. <laughs> <Okay. Here I laughs> <am. laughs> Any idea? Awesome. Timber. Timber. You're going to see it on the mountaintops. Laguna and Palomar both display a positive Frid. I'm not sure if it's accurate or not. Well, well. Because at least Laguna, for sure, we know through the cores, through looking at the actual data, that it requires a lot of fire. Again, with Palomar, I don't know. But it shows a positive. Anyway, so, and then uh, the opposite is that Fred is showing negative numbers. I guess this makes sense if you think negative, too much fire, especially in Southern California. So where are you going to see negative numbers in the West? Down south. Down south? Pretty much everywhere in Southern California, you're going to see too much fire. And you're also going to see that around Wui areas, in valleys, around houses, and things like that. But that should be uh, smaller. Military <laughs> bases. Yeah. <laughs> Pendleton is like one giant negative. It's like a big negative three. But that that's place. actually true. Uh, and then there is a strength that's associated with this. So the further positive or negative, the stronger the deviance. But if it's like, say, negative one, that does not directly correlate to, say, one missed fire turn in your head. Although you can calculate it to show that. The max CC FRI that I do is, is just 0 to 3, uh, negative 3 to 0 to positive 3. So 3 is the maximum. So it's a relative scale. Make sense? Okay, so the further positive or negative is further to deviance level. Let's look at Mount Laguna. Forget this negative 999, that's just missing data. You have negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. There's no 0, actually. 1, 2, and 3. Remember, what's negative What's negative showing you? What's the negative number? Too much fire. Too much fire, right? Positive number, what's the positive number? Not enough. Not enough fire. Knowing that, let's look at... Uh, this is the Descanso District primarily. This is Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. This is the mountaintop here. This is... The brush fields, where's Interstate 8? This is Interstate 8 right here. Everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. Interstate 8, Sunrise Highway is somewhere in here. So what is all this yellowish? Yeah, it's showing, but what is the magnitude of that? Remember? One. So it's negative one. What is negative one? Remember how it's a relative magnitude? 
So what is that saying about the amount of fire that's been on that landscape? A little too much, right? Negative one is like a little too much. There's some areas of negative two, right? Yeah. What's that? Carpe. Carpe. <laughs> <laughs> and then what is? There's some negative three, right? Here, here, here. Holy. What is part of the cedar fire? Uh, probably cedar and witch combined, and, and then some others. But like, w remember what I said? Interstate eight is right here. You got red off here, red off here. A bunch of red off in here. Yeah, there's probably cedar and witch in here. No, I mean those. That's this is like the classic story of Southern California is too much fire. This is a, showing the FRID data, and this is what we use the FRID data to demonstrate this. Now, do you see any differences, any wild differences on this map here? No. Yeah, right? What's up here? Brown. Brown, whatever. What is brown? Positive. 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 Now, I would have to say that this data clearly does not include the prescribed firework that the Descanso Ranger District has been doing for the last 15 years. Because what I would probably like to see this is this blue. And there's one little speck of blue. There's a couple little specks of blue or purple or maybe whatever the color that is, which is probably overlapping a prescribed burner, or like maybe a fire or something. So you could look at this data, but a lot of this has actually been treated. But what it's showing, and if you look at the Palomar Mountain one, it would show the same thing, but what it's showing is that that little pocket, you can almost tell like where the trees are, right? That's what they want to model it as. This is almost a very cliche approach. It needs to be ground truth, but this is what it looks like. And you see vast areas of this negative three, which is just showing these wide departures from the range of variability. I want, does it, you follow those? All right, let's go. Good? Everybody good on this one? So, in what time frame is this uh, allotting? Is this one year's worth of info? No, this is uh, aggregated. It has all the fire history. But it was calculated for, I think I pulled this map in like 2012. Yeah, I think I pulled this map for the first class. It doesn't do state state area, state park area? <laughs> you know what, I think I clipped it to the forest. Uh, yeah, so you can actually... Can you? I'm not sure what the data source is. I think it's something Hugh Safford does, so I think it's clipped to the forest. It's a good question though, but you could, there's some uh, there's some state data that you can get. It'd probably look about the same. I'm guessing this yellow probably connects to that yellow, right? <laughs> Maybe not. So when you say that the scale is relative, all that means is that the numbers could have been one through 10 and you would have had more colors in there. Exactly, okay. exactly. It's just negative three to three. Uh, again, there's different. I think there's a way to calculate that where it'll actually show the number of missed intervals, but that just gets messy. So does it, does, uh, it just, you said for wildfire, does it include fuels, treatments, and prescribed fire into so that data? That's what I'm saying. It's missing that data. I've, I've seen most of the time it's missing that data. The reason is we're really terrible at forwarding our data up. Uh, except the last few years we've been getting the fax data, like I think it's only since 2011 or so, maybe 2010, since the fax requires the GIS data to be included, but for some reason I'm not seeing it um, included. And but we also, the footprints aren't very large. Scott Fire, you have to do PFERS, right, every time? Is that yeah, but that does, that's not a reporting process. Yeah, PFERS is just uh, for the region to see what we're up to. Yep, so it all gets put in at the end of the year with GIS. Okay, and here's just a closer up look of that same area, right, so this is brown. This is just a closer up look, so you see a lot of yellow, you can see Interstate 8 a little bit better. Off the fire, off the freeway, and then up on the mountain, that brown and that variability. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just going to talk a little a few here. We're kind of getting into the nuts or the the potpourri at the end of this um, statement. So it goes back to what does this all mean for fuels management? Um, and what do I mean by that? What what does fire regime? What is everything that we've talked about so far? Knowing fire regimes, knowing condition class, knowing the frid, knowing all the things that go into Fire regimes, the fire regime factors. How, what does that mean for fuels management? Um, I don't know if you guys want to try to answer this, but I, and I got kind of an answer right there. Uh, is it really goes back to the goals and objectives of a fuels project or a restoration, if you're doing a restoration or anything? Um, it all goes back to the goals and objectives. You have to remember how I said you have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. I don't like to say this a lot of times in public, but a lot of the times I've seen. 
projects do not have strong goals and objectives. And they made it all the way through NEPA, and nobody has really sat down to define what we're doing, why, and how it relates to all these things that we've talked about today. Seasonality. Why are we burning? Why are we? Why does the soil have to be wet? What is that going to affect? What, you know, are we just trying to cover our ass? Are we trying to protect, you know, our, our little pet owl or whatever? You know, what is the greater good? Um, so, what I want you get the reason I'm presenting this information to you guys today, and again, I want you to understand it is, um, is, is really goes all, ultimately back to the goals and objectives of this project. You have to understand what that is. When you go as a, as a prescribed fire burn boss or whatever, you should know what the hell you're trying to do and how that relates to the fire ecology of the area. What are you doing to the fire regime? Um, even if you're purposely screwing it up like we do on fuel breaks, that's cool. That's all right. Our LMP allows that. Our land management plan allows us to. It, it literally says we're allowed to type convert fuel breaks because they know that the socio-political use of that piece of ground is a fuel break. It's not going to be a place where a uh, spotted owl is. All right? It's going to be a place where we try to stop the fire to protect these people's houses or whatever. Um, so, but still, you need to understand that when you do that, you're affecting that ecosystem. And, and you might, like the, the guys in the 50s and the 60s were figuring out that if we went and burned it in the winter, hey, we didn't get the same response. The chaparral didn't come back because we were we're skipping that, that, uh, that we were not allowing the seeds to, you know, regenerate, or not allowed the seeds to, to sprout, to come up. You know what I'm saying, right? Uh, which is, you know, the dark side of fuels management, which is, you know, a lot of times these fuels, you know, as fuels people, we want to think we're doing the best thing for the landscape. Uh, but in reality, from an ecological point of view, we're not. Uh, we're doing the opposite of that. But we're also meeting other objectives. Um, Again, there's two main, and we talked about this before, there's two main categories of fuels treatments. There's the ones that are we're trying to restore and maintain the fire regime condition class. And uh, I say the distance side because that's usually the back 40 work, right? That's the stuff out in the hills. We want to try to get, the few, uh, we want to get stuff functioning out there properly, and then someday we can walk away from it and just let nature do its thing. Right, that's never going to happen, but at least that's a goal that we can try to seek towards. And then there's the up close, which is, you know, protecting human infrastructure. Those are the two main categories, really, I think of in terms of fuels management. The restoration side, and then the, the human infrastructure protection side, which is not light on the land. Um, but if, when we're out in the back 40, when we're up on Laguna, we should be thinking about what is the proper stocking, right? The stocking is the number of trees, you know, thinking about maybe can we protect these cypress trees, you know, all these sort of things. This is what I want you guys to do as professional fuels and fire managers. So, um, it's how you go into design a fuels project. You have to understand it. You have to understand these concepts to design and justify a project while you're doing it correctly. Um, this is a, a saying I like. I heard this in forestry school. Doctors bury their mistakes. Foresters try to pass them <laughs> for the rest of their career. You know what that means? It means if you screw something up out there, you're gonna see it. Every You're gonna day. see it forever. Yeah. So anyway, blah, blah. fuels must be. Allowed. We talked about this before. The fuels must be ready before the fire is introduced. That's just a repeat. Remember, You're not gonna have a characteristic fire if you don't have characteristic fuels. You guys should be able to quote that by the time we're done with this. Not gonna have a characteristic fire without a characteristic fuels. So I think that's. I think we call that good, guys. Right? Yeah, prescribed fire is a fallacy because we never do it when we should do it. We already talked about that. Chaparral, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we'll talk about chaparral a lot. We already talked about ignition frequency changes. You guys can read this. If you guys have any questions about this, we'll talk about it later. And we'll talk about climate change as well, too. Yeah. Yeah, way too much stuff. All right. So the objective of this class was to talk about difference between a fire regime, which we talked a lot about fire regimes, and the difference between that and a condition class, remember a condition class is just a way to describe a fire regime, to measure the relative departure from that fire regime from normal, um, what the role of it, we touched a little bit about what the role that is in fuels management, we'll talk about that more, and uh, ways to identify regimes and condition classes. So condition class, you can kind of look at FRID as a variant of that, and then there's different fire regime classifications, remember the hardy ones. The five fire regimes, those are the standard, those are the gold standard, but I wanted to introduce you to that new framework fire regime that 
is in the Fire in California <coughs> Ecosystems text because I just think it's, it's really good. It's robust and not many people know about it, so I want to take that opportunity. Plus it explains it so much better. I think you guys would agree with that, right? So, uh, are there any questions or anything? Do you think we met those objectives? Do you guys, tell me honestly, do you guys understand the concept of a fire regime? Getting there. Getting there? So do you understand, remember, a fire regime is, if you have chaparral, chaparral, we know that chaparral wants to burn 35 to 100 years. Chaparral wants to have a high severity fire. Um, it's a, if you want to use the new framework terminology, it'd be a, what, a medium interval. So it can accept some minor variation. It's not a truncated. Um, what else is chaparral? Oh, uh, oh, and it wants to burn in, so seasonality, it wants to burn in the summer. Um, it wants to burn high intensity, high severity. That is what a fire regime is. And that's what we talk about when we talk about fire regimes, whether restoring a fire regime or, um, well, mostly restoring fire regimes or simply being able to describe it. And every set of veg vegetation, whether it be a stand of ponderosa pine or arctic tundra or a tropical rainforest, a fire regime and those same metrics can be placed over the top of them. Seasonality, fire return interval, all those same metrics can be applied. And the only difference is the vegetative type. Make sense? And it's simply a way for us to be able to say, ponderosa pine, or uh, I don't want to confuse it. Never mind, I'm not going to do that. It's just a way to distinguish. It's just a way to distinguish it, a way to talk about it, a way to restore it, a way to get it back, a way to identify if it's not functioning properly. And again, we have value to a functioning uh, ecosystem. And there might be practical matters, such as hydrological issues, watershed issues, that as humans, as a society, we need it to be functioning properly. Um, yeah. Okay? All right. So that's it for the, for the lecture. The rest of the time is yours. If you have any questions, let me know. I do, I do actually, there's one real quick thing I want to go back over. Again, if there's any concepts or anything in this class, this, the last thing I want is for you guys to sit in the class and to, for me to be explaining something or somebody else to be explaining something and for you, you not to quite get it, right? Um, I, I, uh, I'd much rather, you know, most of the time in these lectures, what I do is I have the most important stuff first and then the less important stuff later. So if we don't get to the stuff later, as you've seen now twice in a row, I don't really care. I want to try to get through the main concepts, but I also, it's not that I want to get through the lecture because I don't care about that. I really, really want to make sure you understand the concept. Um, I know you won't always understand the concept right away, so hopefully we'll circle back and uh, reinforce that with lectures and everything. But if you have a question, if you don't understand it, either come to me at a break or talk to me or, or bring it up during the class if you're cool with that or, or try to find a way to understand or, or ask the next class session or whatever. But the most important thing is just find a way for me or whoever's around you to get you to understand that concept because that's what I want. There's no reason for you to be here, no reason for me to be teaching or anything if you don't understand the concept, concepts that we're teaching. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So again, I don't know if we're achieving that objective or not. I, it's, it's really super important to me that that objective be met. Um, this isn't college. You know, this isn't one of the things where you pay $500 and I just come and teach the thing and I cash my check and I don't care. You know, this is, we're all doing this because we want to be here. Is that what college is? <laughs> yes, that's what college is. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, you know what I mean? That's what it is. Like, professors in a college, it's pretty impersonal. They, I mean, I guess I would think they would want you to know. But, um... Yeah, some are like that. Some, yeah, some cash the check. Some are really... Some are just cashing the check. I'm not just here cashing the check. I'm here because I want you guys to understand these concepts. Because I am very passionate about this subject. I'm very familiar with the subject, though, so sometimes it's hard for me to see my blind spots as an instructor. Um, or somebody else, you know, one of you guys might say something that somebody else doesn't understand. So, please, please... In the future, um, just let me know if those things are happening because I'm open to it. You know what I mean? You, you understand where I'm coming from? So I don't. I do not want to waste your time. Okay? It's, it's okay. Let yourself off the hook. It's all right. I think we're okay. Yeah, I, I'm on the hook, man. That's that's my point. I I'm totally on the hook. I'm here for you guys. All right? So just keep that in mind because ultimately I'm like you. Go home, Scott. <laughs>